As I say, I hope what I tell you isn't too much different to what you heard this morning. I'll get used to this and I'll try and uh, push the buttons. Okay, so I haven't done the full title in your, in your agenda. Um, so I'm going to talk about adjuvant therapy and hopefully answer some of the questions. Um, this is histology, large gastric gist. And this is Birmingham, from, uh, that's the new Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And, um, and I think we are just about somewhere. I think that's, that, that, that is some blue, so we must be next door. So the hospital, the, Q, the QE was opened about three or four years ago. Um, and I gave this talk about five years ago. Uh, there was no QE and um, the information available on adjuvant therapy was somewhat different. So it went from being who should we give it to and, and why to should patients be offered adjuvant therapy. And that was, I think, in 2009. So f just very quickly for those who are maybe newer to the uh, GIST um, family than others, imatinib, GIST went, you probably all know all this, but just to put it into perspective, um, GIST went described into the 1980s as a specific entity. And they are generally considered to be chemo-resistant and radio-resistant. And there wasn't much to offer patients with advanced disease. And then in 2001 at ASCO, which is a huge oncology meeting, there were 20,000, no, about 100,000 delegates uh, in the American Society of Clinical Oncology, in the main session, which has the latest breast cancer, the latest bowel cancer trials, they had two out of five sessions on GIST and this drug, ST1571. And it is one of the few things, genuinely, in medicine that was absolutely groundbreaking and a huge quantum leap forward in the management for patients. And it was all based on this thing called C-Kit, which I think Philippe Tanya spoke to you about in a lot more detail than I could. And this imatinib had been introduced for chronic myeloid leukemia, which we've known when I was at medical school had something called the Philadelphia chromosome. And as that developed over the years, it was realized this was a growth promoter for the tumor and imatinib was developed to block the uh, promoter of CML. And it was recognized that the C-kit was very similar to the um, ABL, I can't know what it's called now, but the Philadelphia chromosome. And so they just thought maybe, maybe imatinib will work in these patients. And the first report was 2001. There were no clinical studies in um, GIST. And it was a lady in Finland who had extensive disease, don't we? She had all sorts of treatment. And just as proof of concept, they started on imatinib. And this is a PET scan, it's easier to walk. Those who've never seen PET scans, it's a uh, radioactive um, injection taken up by tumors, including GIST. So all this, it just shows hot radioactivity. And within a month, this is bladder, which contains urine, which excreted, it had gone. I remember someone saying, we were a bit concerned, we've got the wrong patient. But this is a CT scan, and that's four months. And again, this, behind, this huge mass here melted. And that was the first patient ever to receive imatinib without any trial, any clinical trial for, in GIST. So we knew it worked well in advanced disease. Um, it was licensed in 2002 and approved by NICE in 2004. Uh, without, a, without any clinical phase three data. I think it was and perhaps still is the, only, the first and perhaps the only drug to be licensed on phase two data. So what is adjuvant therapy? Well, it's treatment given after definitive treatment to reduce the chance of the disease coming back. And adjuvant, can, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer has been allowed, well, tamoxifen then chemo has been around for 30 years, bowel cancer at least 20 years. Now, the advantages are it may improve your chance of being cured. It may stop the disease coming back, or it may, if not stop it, delay it. And we'll talk about whether that's a good endpoint um, later. The disadvantages are a lot of patients get it who don't need it because we don't know it's a group of patients who appear to have been cured, but we know some of them, it will come back. And so a lot of patients will have this treatment who will never need it. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for everybody, so there'll be a group of patients who have the treatment for absolutely no benefit. And you've got to weigh up against that, the toxicity and the financial cost. 
And certainly for bowel cancer, we talk about a 5 to 7% survival benefit for chemotherapy. So that means that you're giving it maybe 1 in 15 people are gaining a benefit, and the other 14 are getting no benefit at all. And it, it's a balance. So we know that for the certain high-risk GIST patients, and overall, the, I, mean, I think this will be historical data because we are diagnosing smaller and smaller tumours, but this is a historical data. The classic survival is about 54% at five years. And we knew if you had a tumour over 10 centimetres, then it fell to 38%. And so the question was, is imatin as it's so effective in advanced disease, may it reduce the recurrence after surgery? Now, you may remember this chap <laughs> with his famous quote, there are, there are no knowns, the things we know, there are the, un the known unknowns, I'll get this wrong, the known unknowns, which are the things we know we don't know, and then there's the unknown unknowns, which are the things we don't know we don't know. I think that was so what are the unknowns? Well, for sake of time, I'll just... You know, which patients are most likely to benefit? Now, you might say, well, give it to every patient, because everybody's at some risk. But then, do you give it to patients who are at 50% of risk, or 80% of risk, or 10% of risk? Because where does the balance hang in terms of toxicity? Um, which patients may benefit? Um, what treatment? Uh, where have we gone? And should it be one treatment fits all? And we'll talk about whether, for example, wild type with exon 9 deletions benefit imatinib. How long should patients be on treatment for? And as I say, is the time, if you can lengthen the time for the tumour coming back again, but don't increase your chance of cure, or even increase your overall survival, is that a benefit to a patient? And you can answer that better than I can. Okay, so there's a number of phase two trials, early work. There was the uh, American College of Surgeons Oncology Group, the, as they call it, the Z9000, which was entered at ASCO 2005-2008. There was a uh, Chinese study, entered in 2007, which has never been updated, and there was a um, Scandinavian study published in the British Journal of Cancer in 2007. And we now have a number of randomised phase 3 trials. There was the uh, Z2009, the Z2009, the Z9001. Um, there was a Scandinavian study, which is now being published, and this, we're still awaiting the data, or any mature data, from the EORT62024. But there was some early data in uh, 2013 in ASCO. So this was a... Um, a small trial in China, they were high risk CD117 positive GISTs, over five centimetres, over uh, five mitoses per high power field. <coughs> Patients started on imatinib 400 milligram daily, but at the end point relapse or metastases. And the recurrence for the survival at one year was 96%, which based on historical data, uh, was thought to be exceptionally good. So certainly the conclusion of this was imatinib seem to delay or potentially delay the occurrence of GIST. So this was um, again just a phase two study, they just took 23 consecutive patients and um, they received imatinib for one year. Don't worry about that. And this was the survival compared to historical controls, or not the survival, the, the, um, the risk of the occurrence compared to um, historical controls. Um, so you can see the top graph, um, very few patients developed recurrence over the um, 108 months, which I can't do the maths, but it's a few years, uh, compared to historic. Now we know, we know as things change, we know as um, medicine moves on, whenever you compare a modern cohort to a historical cohort, you tend to see an improvement in survival. But this was considered uh, more than just um, historical and evolution of medicine. And then there was the American, uh, the Z9000, and this took um, high risk gists over 10 centimetres, or ruptured, or multifocal, CKIP positive, complete resection, and they had imatinib for um, 12 months. And the uh, plan of the end point was survival. So this was the, um, the occurrence for the survival. 
in terms of um, let's see. and this was the overall survival up to three years and again based on historical data this was thought to be um, very positive and um, worth looking at further so they moved on to a phase a phase three trial uh, randomized double blind study so patients got either placebo or they got imatinib they had to be uh, CK positive just over three centimeters which wasn't very big had to be completely resected no imatinib within 70 days now the primary objective here was the occurrence of the survival and I think by the time this was published everybody knew what it would show but of course it was um, it was commenced in a time in the early 2000s when we did not know as much as we knew by the time it was published. Second, the objective overall survival. And this was the uh, schema. So patients started on placebo or imatinib for one year. If they got the occurrence on placebo, they went on to imatinib 400. And if they got the occurrence on imatinib 400, they went up to 800. And they were followed up for 10 years. Uh, don't worry about all the data in this slide, but out of the number of patients, only uh, a, s a small percentage, or relatively small percentage, had uh, large tumours. Uh, and a significant proportion, about 80% of patients, didn't even complete a matinib for 12 months because of toxicity. Now, this was first um, presented at ASCO, and then it was um, published in 2008. I'm just going to show the uh, comparative data. So this was the uh, early data, and this was for tumours um, three, three to six centimetres diameter. Um, and again, what you can see is the uh, orangey sort of colour line at the top, um, and the uh, was imatinib, and the green line is placebo. So this shows that um, in the first two years, there's a difference in terms of the occurrence of disease. So placebo is delaying the occurrence, but by the time you get to three years, the patients, the same number of patients in each group has recurred. And in fact, this is the updated data, and the curves are very similar. This is the um, three to six centimetre tumours, uh, very small numbers, so the lines appear to be, uh, the matinib seems to be doing a lot worse, uh, but that's just uh, very small numbers at that time. And again, what actually happens is, um, by the time you get to three years, uh, the curves come together. Uh, and this was the uh, tumour 6 to 10 centimetres. I think I got that wrong, sorry, could have gone backwards. This is the uh, over 10 centimetres, where the curves seem to show some divergence. And the mature data, again, appears to show some divergence, but they appear to be coming together. Now, the early data from overall survival showed that there was no difference. The lines basically overlap. And the more mature data showed that lines overlap. And what this study really showed was that um, if you gave matinib for 12 months, you could delay, or you appeared to delay, the occurrence of GIST that were going to recur, but you did not stop it recurring, and patients weren't living any longer. And the number of the criticisms of this, where they really a high-risk population, it was quite a mismatch of patients. Is one year sufficient? And there's a lot of debate among the surgeons uh, in the UK and the, more, the bigger centres that this, these patients were treated in small centres, a lot of different centres, and there was a question mark how, big this, how good the surgery was. And if they meant also included tumour rupture and multifocal disease, which actually we've been, I've been giving imatinib to patients who've ruptured their tumours at surgery uh, since it came out really, because we know these patients are very high risk and probably shouldn't be included in adjuvant trials. And we also know some French data. Um, so the French had a number of trials where they stopped imatinib in patients with advanced disease. And they did it after one year. And what happened was the progression for the survival and the overall survival. So what happened was when patients stopped imatinib, at about six months, they started to um, recur. But you could be salvaged by going back on imatinib. And so they moved to um, three years, imatinib, and again, once you stopped imatinib, the, um, the, the uh, tumour came back, but again, you were salvaged by going back on imatinib. So the question is, if you have ad is it, do you need adjuvant treatment 
when you've got a very effective salvage treatment? Or you stop, if you're not stopping the gist coming back, you can avoid having imatinib if you don't need it, and when the gist does come back, you start on imatinib. And this was suggested by the French data in advanced disease, and that mirrored the uh, Z9001. And it didn't matter, and that's been updated now to five years as well, it didn't matter if you took imatinib for one year, three years, or five years, it was still about six months after stopping it, then uh, that's when the disease started to come back again. So we've now got, and that was the data we had in 2009. And then there was the um, Scandinavian group, which they looked at uh, tumours over 10 centimetres, over 10 centimetres with a high mitotic rate, or over 5 and 5 of both tumour spirit centimetres. And they gave imatinib 400 for the, a year or 400 for three years. And then there's the second study, is the EORTC, which gave imatinib versus placebo for two years. 900 patients randomised. So after 2009, in 2010, before the uh, date of the, the Scandinavian trial came out, uh, we took a um, proposal to NICE for adjuvant imatinib, and it was turned down. So in the UK, in 2010, you could not have adjuvant imatinib. So this is the um, Scandinavian study. There's approximately 400 patients uh, randomised, 200 to each group, for imatinib for one year, 12 months, or for 36 months. And then again, they did include patients who had had uh, tumour rupture and um, multiple sites of disease, but these were excluded. So they had the overall intention to treat population but they also had what they called the efficacy population, which were those patients who uh, had, they had just confirmed at a major centre, at a reference centre. They did not have metastases at study, and they did not have um, tumour spillage. Don't worry about this, other than uh, you won't see it at the back. But this is the number of the patients. About 90% were considered high risk by modern criteria. So this was a very different population. And this is the, um, the, this is the intention to treat um, graphs. So on the left, you've got the occurrence for the survival. Um, 36 months versus uh, 12 months. And this is the efficacy population. So when you took out the patients who they didn't really want in. And again, you can see there is a delay, or there appears to be a delay, and the curves haven't come together. So there's a delay in the, in the gist coming back in this study, up to six years. And if you look at the overall survival, there was a survival benefit in terms of three years over uh, one year. So this wasn't placebo controlled, so we didn't have a no, um, a no imatinib arm, but it actually showed that you could improve survival by giving imatinib for three years versus one year. And the occurrence for the survival was 48 times, 48% uh, versus 66%. Uh, the p-value uh, is a statistical measure to say, was this by chance? Uh, less than 0 0.05 is thought to be a good and uh, statistical um, level. So this is highly statistically significant. This couldn't occur by chance. And likewise, the overall survival was 82% versus 92%. And this was the first study that suggested survival benefits um, for adjuvant imatinib. And the Cancer Drugs Fund, which is in the news all the time, and apparently is going to go for a few more years. Uh, NICE still haven't uh, they appraised it, but that we can now get adjuvant uh, imatinib for patients with high risk gist following surgery, funded through the Cancer Drugs Fund. So it's got to be high risk, completely resected and we can give treatment for 36 months. So what about the EORTC um, 62024? This, this was a placebo controlled, so this was going to really show you whether imatinib was better than not having imatinib, although the Scandinavian study suggests that the longer you have it, so if you don't have any, probably the more you have the better. Um, and the primary endpoint, as it should be, in any adjuvant study was overall survival. But unfortunately, there weren't enough events in order to, uh, and the data, 
um, never, uh, has never been published yet. And they changed the endpoint a few years ago to what they called the time to imatinib failure or the imatinib failure for the survival. So the argument is that you have imatinib for two years, you then stop imatinib, and then if the gist comes back, you start imatinib and you take it until you get imatinib failure. Or in the placebo arm, you don't have imatinib, maybe your gist comes back a bit sooner, but you start imatinib and then you stay on it until you get imatinib failure. So the question is, and that's thought to be a surrogate for overall survival. So it's the same point. So whether you can get, whether if you have a year or two years in this case, then some time off and then start, do you get the same duration when you start again as if you have nothing, you start a bit earlier. So maybe if you've had it for two years, you have a year off, then you start it again, you get two years benefit. So you've got five years. Or maybe if you don't have it, you have two years off, then you start and you take it for three years and you still get five years. And so trying to answer the question is, can you salvage patients very effectively by giving it when they need it? And hence, can you avoid adjuvant um, therapy? And again, it was published, the immature data was published um, last year and the recurrence for the survival seem to be better, but we know that from all the other data. However, the five-year survival, or the failure to, um, the imatinib failure survival, uh, 87 versus 84, was not statistically significant. So on the current data, this study is not showing a survival benefit for adjuvant imatinib. It was a five-year survival, was 100% versus 99%, which is fairly reassuring. Against that, and I always say to patients, or often say to patients, you know, you've got to weigh up what you're going to benefit and what you're going to, uh, to lose. And if I can give you a tablet you're going to take for five years that has absolutely no side effects, and it might work and it might not, it's a very small chance you'll take it. If I give you a very toxic treatment, you need to know there's a big gain, otherwise um, you're not going to take it. And interestingly, what we see in a lot of adjuvant studies and is some really counterintuitive, that when we give chemotherapy to patients with advanced disease who are ill, they cope with it better than when you give it to patients with adjuvant who are basically fit and well and they cover them surgery. And the theory is that if you've got advanced cancer and the chemotherapy is working and it's helping, you feel better and you carry on with it. If you're completely well and you're taking some treatment that makes you feel less well, you're less inclined to carry on with it. Um, and we've seen that in lots of studies. This was just some data from many years ago, we had a lot more patients now. Um, a lot of you will know the, the side effects better than I will. Um, this was the, um, the Z9000, the early phase two state data. Um, 18% grade three toxicity, that's toxicity that's significantly affecting quality of life. Um, so grade one, few symptoms, grade two, it's starting to affect you. You've got grade three toxicity, it's significantly affecting your 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 day-to-day -day living. So that's almost one in five patients. Um, that's a very busy slide. Um, now interestingly, as every placebo controlled trial shows, uh, placebo in green and uh, imatinib in orange. So actually, for, uh, for mild toxicity, <laughs> taking placebo is worse than taking imatinib. And Placebo trials persistently and consistently show a significant number of toxicities. Um, but clearly, once you get to the serious, which is severe effect on life, and life-threatening in four, uh, clearly imatinib is potentially uh, a toxic drug. So, which patient should we give it to? So, from early on, we knew there were two significant prognostic factors. One, we knew size was very important. And two, we knew that mitotic index was important. And the initial prognostic scores were based on size and uh, mitotic index. But we also now know that depending on where your tumour uh, starts, in which, of the GI, which part of the GI tract, that is also a significant prognostic factor. 
And of course, we now know where your mutation is, it also can be prognostic, but more importantly, perhaps, it determines how you are likely to respond to imatinib. And basically, I hope I get this right, and Philippe will tell me if I get it wrong, but it's not here, so that's okay. Exon 11 mutations are here, just inside the membrane. Like I said, this is an American slide, so in America, Gleevec is Gleevec with a double E, uh, blocks here. And so this is the mutation, this is the site on the uh, ligand blocked by um, imatinib, and that's the classic exon 11 mutation. Other mutations on different parts of that ligand are less likely to be blocked by imatinib. So as I say, this was the initial um, Fletcher classification in 2002 based on size and mitotic index. I don't know about this. And this was the uh, metrin um, where they looked at size, index, and also site of disease. Don't worry about that. This is a slide I used before. And then there was the uh, modified uh, classification that patients that should be considered for adjuvant imatinib over five centimetres and over five mitoses per 50 high power field, over 10 centimetres in any um, mitotic count, any size and over 10 mitoses per 50 high power field. And then there were some other groups. Um, so we know that gastric tumours generally do better than non-gastric tumours. Um, and again, tumour rupture, I think a lot of us still believe that that's not truly adjuvant and if you had a ruptured tumour, as I said, I put people on, on imatinib indefinitely. And not exon 9. So the question is, and that comes back to the question earlier, should all patients get adjuvant imatinib, whatever their mutation? So uh, using these section criteria, about, th about a third of patients with a gastric gist would be considered, um, about uh, two-thirds of non-gastric gists and 50% of all just, so overall that works out for the whole population, about 50. Now interestingly, and I think I've lost a slide somewhere, when you looked at the um, Scandinavian study, they looked at the different subgroups and there was a benefit for each type of um, exon uh, mutation, which we wouldn't have thought. So we th would think that nines and um, wild types would not benefit. Um, now, that was a very small subgroup analysis, and there were very small numbers of patients, but there was a consistent benefit, whatever the mutation. So, so what answers do we know? These, these are perhaps now the, uh, the known knowns. Will treatment prevent or just delay the occurrence? Well, we're still not entirely sure. Um, the Scandinavian data um, appears to show a survival benefit, but will the curves eventually come together? So at 10 years, maybe the curves will come together. But of course, if you can uh, stop people dying for a lot longer, that is still a benefit. So the question is, will we still, is there any chance of imatinib curing patients? And we just don't know the answer to that. But it certainly seems to make people live longer in the adjuvant setting in the Scandinavian study, but this hasn't been confirmed in the EORTC study. What is the optimal length of time? Well, we know that three years appears to be better than one year, and that's all we know in length of time. You know, maybe five years better than three years, maybe indefinitely, maybe you should start imatinib and then carry on indefinitely. We don't know. And that goes back to what we already discussed. Maybe we can just wait, and okay, your gist comes back a bit sooner, because Imatinib's not, never going to stop it coming back, it will delay it coming back, so instead of coming back at five years, it comes back at four years, instead of eight years, it comes back at six years, or vice versa. So it may be you get just the same benefit by waiting and starting, and lots of people avoid getting adjuvant treatment who didn't need it. And this was a, a question we used to ask, that maybe, if you're, potentially, is the, are you worse off if you have adjuvant treatment? Because do you actually induce, we know as GIST develop, they develop further mutations. And that's why you sometimes see patients with multiple sites of disease controlled by imatinib 
and then just one side starts to progress. And that's because as the tumour carries on and, and longer time, it, set, it develops secondary mutations which allow it to escape just, uh, imatinib control. So is it possible that by giving people imatinib early, you can actually increase the rate of mutations? And it, is it possible you could actually um, disadvantage them for future imatinib? Now, there's absolutely no data to suggest that, but it was a, um, an interesting question. And this comes back again to, um, are the patients unlikely to benefit? Well, according to the Scandinavian study, even those um, mutations which are not strictly or considered um, sensitive um, did appear to benefit, but numbers very small. And should it be tailored to uh, mutation? So maybe we shouldn't be giving imatinib to everybody. Uh, maybe we should give uh, sinitinib to some people. We just don't know that, and there's no data. So, where do we go in the future? Well, the ERTC will hopefully give us uh, some, further, some further data. And um, this is the slide I always finish on, which is a bit naughty, really. But, uh, you know, what, what will come out in the future? But more to the point, can we afford it? For those who can't see it, so this, is, this is one of those new miracle drugs. If you can afford it, it's a miracle. And as the... Um, as they've decided, we're going to have to keep on reducing the burden on the NHS by 3% per year for the next five years. And we've already done it for the last five years at 3% per year. Even if you use simple interest, and probably it's mathematicians, that turns out to be a 30% deduction in 10 years. And actually, it's compounded, so it's a lot more than that. So there's going to be an £8 billion gap by uh, 2020. Um, so, you know, what will the future hold? What new drugs will come out? And more importantly, we'll be able to afford them. So that's my take on adjuvant treatment. So I hope it didn't um, differ too much uh, from what you heard this morning. And I hope it at least answered some of your questions, if not created more than it answered. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be quite a lot of questions after that because the quest, you know, questions that were raised this morning about taking adjuvant um, imatinib, you may have sort of had a bit of a rethink now. Um, I know um, when I was offered adjuvant after my liver resection, I decided no, um, and my consultant was happy with that. We agreed that I wouldn't take it. I'd wait until it came back, if it was going to come back. And I'm five, four years on, I'm happy that I made that decision. I've saved the NHS some money. I haven't had side effects for, four, for those four years, and it's still there for me if I need it. But I know other people take a very different view and would rather sort of back the horse both ways, as it were. So are, are there any questions from the floor that people would like to ask. Um, my husband's coming to the end of three years. On the, my husband's coming to the end of three years on Glavac after a large tumour has been removed and all the rest of it. So if it comes back in six months' time, is that classed as a secondary? And would it have to go on to different treatment? No, that, that, would be, that, that would be a concurrence. Well, it's not a second, well, it's a concurrent disease, but it's not in terms of, it's not an imaginative failure. Yeah, yeah. So is it, is it a secondary, is it the current of the local site? But I guess the question is, does he need to move on to second line treatment? And no. So the first line of treatment after imaginative, Okay, if you fail adjuvant imatinib and disease comes back while on it, then you'll move on to second-line therapy. If you have stopped it and the disease comes back, then you go back on imatinib. And the French data suggests that by far the majority of people will respond just as well, um, indefinitely. So that then becomes um, the current disease and you will stay on it until you um, develop progression on imatinib. Or if, yes, um, or you know, potentially you could operate, and if it's a solid through the courage, you may operate when it comes back. Or you may downstage, but not allowed to downstage, uh, nice say no. 
But then we all have plenty of patients who we really can't quite operate, so we can imagine if we can make it smaller, and lo and behold, we can. So we can always... Uh, there's no one very official here, are there? <laughs> <laughs> there's nobody official here, is there? A couple of reps from uh, pharma companies. That's okay. Nobody from NICE? No, there's nobody from NICE. Okay. <laughs> we have been known to slightly bend the rules <laughs> in patients' favour. <laughs> Anybody else got questions about? Oh, sorry. Uh, just a brief comment. Um, you won't know about non compliance, will you? Um, unless some of your patients admit to that. Uh, but there is data I've seen from a French. French group that non-compliance, this is of people who are ill and that would normally be expected, was up to 25%. These are people who regularly stopped the treatment and had a break and a rest. Um, I would have thought non-compliance with adjuvant treatment would be higher. Is that a feeling you have? And that the benefits of adjuvant leave it would then be greater than, than, you, than it appears. Oh, I'm going to get fit. <laughs> yeah, we should have had two mics. Maybe I should just follow the microphone. Yeah. No, it is, a, it is a good question. We know that there's always non-compliance uh, with tablets. You know, people get a week's supply of antibiotics and they, take, they feel better in two days and they stop and they, they haven't sorted out the infection. Now, a good study, um, the patient should bring the, the, the remaining tablets back. So you count out the tablets. Now, of course, the savvy patient will realise they're being checked and just flush them down the toilets or, or leave them at home. Um, I think the question is, is if you're non-compliant and you don't take them for a couple of days, does that matter? So because of the way imatinib works, and we know that if you stop it, it takes six months, if every few weeks you don't take it for a couple of days, does that matter? It probably doesn't. Um, but we, just haven't, we haven't got the data. That's, there's no data on that. But you're right. Generally, people don't take tablets. But that's, um, yes, sanitinib was, was started at too high a dose. Um, and although according to NICE, and again, it's one of those things we just don't follow the rules, allegedly. Some other people don't anyway, obviously I do. Um, so 50, 50 mg per day for, is, is toxic, and you cannot carry on that. And there's evidence um, in kidney cancer and for uh, neo uh, neuroendocrine tumours, neuroendocrine tumours, the starting dose is 37.5 daily, indefinitely. And a lot of the time, I will start patients on 37.5, and it's better tolerated. But that's because, now whether it's better, it may, be, it may be more effective, but that's four weeks on, two weeks off. That's very different to missing a few doses. Um, but you, you can't take that dose of snitinib indefinitely. No, no, but no, no. But, it, 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 yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer. Sorry. Shall I just walk over with it? That would be easier. Thanks. I know, I know my place. <laughs> Patients always come first, don't they? Um, two questions. Can you clarify where we are, as far as you know it, with the NICE committee meeting with reference to it being approved by the NHS for use in the adjuvant setting? And the second question, I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Just that one first while you're thinking about no, it. No, I have. Is memory loss a side effect? <laughs> <laughs> That's a serious question. Yes, yeah, so it's a bit like how many people are going to get diagnosed with uh, dementia now. In the next six months, there'll be so many people dying with dementia now, the GPs get £55 for every diagnosis. <laughs> um, I'll answer your first question, your second question first, not as far as I know. <laughs> but then I've actually forgotten. <laughs> I was going to say, I've forgotten your first question. That was genuine, but no, they remembered. No, that was not a joke. That, that unfortunately, was genuine. Um, yeah, I spoke to Ian, saw Ian Judson last week, who most of you, a lot of you will know, and it's, it's, it's going back to NICE. Now, I was part of the uh, Birmingham group. It's uh, the university put together the submission for NICE. And I can probably tell you, um, but don't tell anybody who told you this. 
it was put to nice as three years, um, and there was no data on the three years. And is anybody here from the company? Because yes. <laughs> the problem was they took the they took the twelve month data and extrapolated it to the same survival benefit and the current year on year on year, and you just can't do that. So. Actually, I went to the NICE meeting and they were very sympathetic. And I think if it had gone for 12 months, they would have accepted it. So, based on the current data of three years, the new data, we're optimistic that it will be accepted. Now, in some ways, it doesn't matter too much because it's funded through the CDF, which is ongoing, and I don't think any of us see there'll be any major change. Um, so it is funded through the NHS, it's just whether it's NICE approved through the commissioning groups or whether it's funded through the CDF. But uh, Ian was optimistic that it would get the nod through NICE. I was at the meeting and I'm also optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I was reasonably sure it had been, wasn't it? Not as far as I know. I, I asked when because you raised it in your... Um, I don't know if anybody else knows better. I saw the in last ten days ago, and it, it hadn't been announced, certainly. Ramesh seems to suggest it had. Well, perhaps he's got some inside information. Well, I, I, as I say, I get all the, mm. because I'm on the top secret panel. Well, you should know. But yeah, but I, it's not, it was a nearly there. I just wondered if you knew if it actually had been rubber I'm, I'm not as high up in the top secret panel as you, I don't think. <laughs> No, 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 no. Far, far down the pecking order, sorry. Oh, do you have to walk about? Are we, are we yeah. Okay. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I'll just leave. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're you okay. I was, no, I wasn't personally involved in it, but I was trying to work out whether you were talking about Cleavic or not. Um, so. Uh, it was the. It was the um, 2010, when we put in the... Um, the yeah, so it's the adjuvant, the adjuvant, the adjuvant, adjuvant yeah. use of imatinib. The final appraisal um, uh, determination has been made public on their website. Um, and it is as was in the ACD. So, as was suggested in the ACD, is now also in the FAD. Um, and that is, it's still, I and think the there may be... Is and the answer is three years. So it's been approved through NICE? Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, I'll check my facts before I do another talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? There's a lady who can't, can't even get there. I'm sure this isn't part of my job to walk down the microphone. My question is uh, about uh, generic Glivic, because in my situation, I no won't wait uh, until my guests come back. I have removed my rectum and I have colostomy, and really this was a traumatic uh, time in my life. And um, really I like to carry on, on Glivic. I know that NHS just can guarantee me three years um, to, do you have some information about generic cleavic, how I can? Um I have no idea, but I know a lady who might be able to uh, tell you some information about that. <laughs> I think the question is, so we get cleavic that's very expensive, and will there be generic imatinib that would be much cheaper? And when does your... When does your um, patent fall off? And will anybody else make it, or is it just too expensive? So we know this much that people have put forward, or companies have put forward, um, for generic. Um, we have uh, a complete patent um, for the product till the end of 2016, and there's a gist... Um, Pattern, a sort of for the gist specific indication that goes thereafter. Um, I think you know there's a very competitive generics market in the UK, and I think it probably goes without saying that generics will come onto the market, and they'll be very competitive. And beyond that, at this point, 
yeah, of course. And, and amongst the generics companies, there'll be competition. Um, Perhaps I should give you a less uh, biased uh, opinion. <laughs> it, now, it won't be genetic, will it? Because it's a biological agent. And so, and I can't remember the correct term. So, if it's a standard, you know, if it's a um, antibiotic, or if it's a, uh, for example, um, a meprazole, a antacid, you now have a lot of azoles, and they just make, and then they're all made very similar. And then, as soon as they come off patent, anybody can make exactly the same drug to the same, um, and just use it because it's exactly the same chemical compound. Now, for biologicals, it's not quite the same, and I can't. I can't remember the exact term, but they're not called genetics. Thank you. Biosimilars. Do you want to answer the question? <laughs> so biosimilars have to go through a much more stringent assessment, and they have to go through a number of the clinical trials. Now, they don't go through all the phase one, phase two. And the argument is that if you make a, a um, biological agent, such as a, um, an IB, the way you make it, it isn't simply a chemical structure. It has to go through a lot of processes. It may be produced by a uh, cell line. Now, we know that some cell lines for certain agents over the years in certain companies have changed. And officially, they should then take that next batch of drug and check it against the first batch, because the cell line is different. So if you have a biological being made by a different company, it can't just come onto the market the day the patent comes out, unless they've done all the work beforehand. I say, it doesn't have to go back through all the early phase, phase one, phase two, but there needs to be a number of studies where it's compared to the standard, um, the standard drug. So the answer is, at the moment, there's no genetics out there, the, or no biosimilars out there, to be precisely. Um, but it is likely, you know, it's, it's a big, big market in Matinib. I can't remember how much it... Uh, was it at one time, it was the second or third biggest selling cancer drug in the UK. It got overtaken by Bevacizumab for bowel cancer and septin. Um, but of course, a lot of it, the big market's also um, leukaemia. Um, so there'll be a huge market for biosimilars. But at the moment, you can't buy them, sorry, because they aren't there. But there was some big thing where you could go to India and buy uh, imatinib, couldn't you? Very, very cheap. But it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, that was being made, wasn't it? That wasn't a genuine article. I can't answer on that, honestly. I don't know. No, I mean, it was in the paper. It wasn't uh, inside information. I think a nib. Maybe it's... Ma I think, I think, I guess the companies, I guess the, uh, I guess one side will argue it uh, needs to be uh, tested and the other side will say no, it's exactly the same. I think it's where the, yeah, it's, it'll fall between the two, no doubt. I was hoping for some easier questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I've been on a matter now for 10 years, I'm still here, but um, um, at various times, uh, 800 has been thought important. Um, uh, obviously, NICE isn't allowing that, I understand. Should we be pushing for that to be allowed? I know I took it once. Um, the side effects were quite se severe or more severe, um, but it definitely worked. No, you're right. very good data on uh, dose, dose increasing. And at one time, we could get it through uh, the company. Um, so before Snitinib got a license, uh, compassionate use, um, they would give, a, give us 400 extra. So patients were being dose escalated. Um, when then once Snitinib got licensed and NICE said no to dose escalation, just because we had to be changed Snitinib. But the data from the early studies, the majority of patients don't benefit. Um, if you look at the original data, the benefit of six or 800 was small compared to 400. And as you say, it's a lot more toxic. But we do know that if you progress on 400, 
there's a good chance of this bonding to 800. And wild type and perhaps exon nines in the subanalysis, they did benefit. So there are groups of patients who do benefit, and nice have got it wrong. Can, can um, clinicians fight to the Cancer Drugs Fund to get the extra? You can, but you've got to show exceptionality. Um, and the way to show exceptionality is virtually impossible because every patient's exceptional, but they just see that, you know, you, c you can't argue it because uh, you can't, the rules are so tight. So you know the answer. No, 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 no. <laughs> no another question. Um, for those of us who have been on, and there's somebody who spoke earlier who's just about to come off um, three years of imatinib, I've just come off it. How long does it take? My experience was when I came off it for the first four weeks, I felt one hell of a lot worse than I was when I was on it. And I've only recently started to feel a bit better. I have terrible headaches and uh, you know, all sorts of other minor problems that were worse than when I was on it. Is that normal? Um, and what is the length of time? My oncologist said it is normal, but the length of time is difficult to predict. It's different in everybody. Is that your experience as well? Another, another question I don't know the answer to, because most patients, historically, when you stopped it, because they either had side effects, and therefore they got better when they stopped it, or they had the current disease, um, progressive disease, and therefore went on something more toxic. So we're only going to start now seeing a cohort of patients who have been well and on it, stopping it. Now, there's, I don't know why you should feel worse when you stop it. Maybe it's anxiety. Been on a drug that's toxicated your body for a long period of time. You come off it, and but you only get cold turkey if it's had some sort of positive physiological effect. Um, so what? What? What are you? What are you withdrawing? I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. I don't, all I know is I felt pretty rough. Does anybody else have a similar experience? We're not coming off it at that. I can't say that that's definitely what it was, but I have been experiencing headaches. Um, and there's also been a slight change in my blood pressure. I've got to say, my experience has been patients, particularly on adjuvant, who have stopped it because they feel awful. And then they feel so, they come back two weeks later and feel so much better. And we start on a 300, no data, but we know that some people don't need as big a dose. And they either tolerate or they stop it, or they get side effects again, and we stop it again, they feel so much better. So, I don't know, sorry. It was just a comment, I was taking it for three years and one month and I felt exactly the same when I came off it as while I was on it. Right. So I've had no withdrawal symptoms. I mean, I just don't understand, I mean, I don't know why, but there may be a reason why you get cold turkey. So. I'm wondering if you've ever had examples... You have to use, you have to use the microphone. Oh. Have you ever had it, an example of people using imatinib, then getting progression of disease, going on to sinitinib, finding it didn't suit them and having to stop, and then you suggesting they go back on imatinib again, and then they, they respond to imatinib again, and it works again? There is some data on uh, the challenging with imatinib, but again, we'd have to sort of bend the rules a bit, or quite a lot. Is that what's called downstaging? Is that what you mean? Uh, no, no, downstaging. So, nice say... If you've got optimal disease, then you have an operation. If you haven't, you have uh, imatinib. Um, now, the question is, if you've got... And, and they say, they've actually said you shouldn't give a neoadjuvant. So neoadjuvant is when you, you, have, you, have a, you have a big tumour, you can't operate. So what you do is you give six months, nine months, and you make the cancer smaller. Now, technically, we're not supposed to do that, but if, officially. But if you have a patient with a big inoperable tumour and they respond very well, six months down the line, you don't say, ooh, I'm not allowed to take it out now, am I? <laughs> so um, we do it. And, and these patients then always go on to the adjuvant as well, because I had one or two patients, and we ummed and awed in the early days, and we stopped it, and they got the cousins within about six, six months. And so now anyone who's had a tumour big enough or bad enough to require neoadjuvant automatically will go on to uh, adjuvant. Um, Although interestingly, inter I've got one patient who had imatinib and didn't tolerate it, had sinitinib and didn't tolerate it, and over the next few years, having stopped everything, and he's just getting, this one started getting smaller, and he's actually had, and I can't explain it. He stopped everything, 
uh, because of toxicity, and his tumour has got smaller and smaller. And we scan him, and we take him to the MDM, and we discuss this, and we check we haven't got the scans mixed up. But I've never, I've never seen that before. <laughs> well, we can't dissect it, and we're not going to now because it's got better. <laughs> I think we just uh, accept it. Right. Right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah I just wonder if there's much data on uh, this drug, regorofenib. Regor Is there anything much to show that that's going to be a drug of the future? Yes. I can't even say it. Um, <laughs> Uh, we don't know. I mean, the other drug that came along was nilotinib, which was the uh, sister of uh, imatinib. Um, and it may have had a place. Some patients did well on it, but the all the trials have been stopped because uh, the data. I mean, there's a lot of new IBs coming along, and I think it's finding the place for each one. And whether, as we learn more, uh, we'll know that certain deletions or mutations, it's better to have one or the other. The other question is combination. Should you have combination IBs? Um, do you do better by having up front? I mean, chemotherapy now, it's very unusual to get single agent chemotherapy, so we know you get a benefit from putting two together, working slightly different ways. And that might be the future for GIST. I've taken the slide down because I thought it was a bit naughty, especially now I know there's some people here who wouldn't want to see that. But, um, you know, but against the cost. I mean, you know, you're going to pay £2,000 a month. What benefit are you going to, what, what benefit would NICE have to see to pay £4,000 a month rather than £2,000 a month? But it is available on the Cancer Drugs Fund as well. So the Cancer Drugs Fund isn't finishing. I read an article in the paper that it was going to be, you know... They've agreed... They've ag the well, they've agreed funding to 2017. Ah. But can you see any political, gov any political party saying, oh, yes, we were, we were giving £200 million a year for cancer drugs and we're going to stop it? No. I mean... <laughs> It was a big con, of course, because they took it in other parts of the NHS. It was not two hundred thousand pounds, two hundred million pounds they gave it. Two hundred thousand, that'd be good, wouldn't it? it? Yeah, yeah, they were, were giving two hundred million pounds for cancer drugs. It went to other places. Okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> any more questions? It's been really, really interesting, and I think um, we owe Dr. Peak a huge vote of thanks for his time and his patience. <laughs>